Dear colleagues, um, this is a web seminar that will discuss uh, pediatric pulmonary hypertension uh, with a special view that's a highlight of um, clinis, clinical science publication over 2019 and early 2020. Over this uh, period, uh, I have noted that there were about 4,000 publications uh, for adult pulmonary hypertension and uh, 626 uh, for pediatric pulmonary hypertension, which denote a quite large interest now in uh, pediatric uh, pulmonary hypertension. My presentation will be in two parts, so you can have access, have access uh, to the first part and then you can stop and uh, maybe come back to, uh, for the second part later. The first part will discuss um, the guidelines that were published uh, recently uh, from the World Symposium, from the European Network and also something on the training in pulmonary hypertension from AEPC. Then we'll discuss a few papers on diagnosis, genetics, and evaluation of pulmonary hypertension. The second part will uh, uh, discuss uh, mainly treatment and risk factors. The guidelines from the last uh, World Congress, one of the main uh, thing that was discussed at this World Congress was a change in the definition of pulmonary hypertension. There was a lot of discussion in the um, pediatric uh, working group to see if we should or not accept this new definition. But finally, we accepted it. And uh, now you know that uh, you're defined as having pulmonary hypertension when you have a mean pulmonary arterial pressure over 20 millimeter of mercury and pulmonary arterial hypertension if uh, uh, the wedge pressure is than 15 and your pulmonary vascular resistance is more than three wood unit. What we have added in uh, the uh, manuscript is that this should be in children over three months of age, knowing that in the first three months, uh, you may still face some transient forms of uh, pH. So that was um, added to uh, uh, the definition. This slide discusses some news about um, irritable pH and in particular the genetic background of pulmonary hypertension. As you know, there is no mutation like BMPR2, ALK1, endoglin, CAV1, KCNK3 and um, AIF2K4 that, uh, especially for the last one, are more related to uh, PVOD. Um, a recent publication in 2016 uh, has shown from the French group that SEVR1, which is uh, Rondiosler disease, and TBX4 are quite common in children. And I think that um, clearly TBX4 has a gain in interest over the last uh, uh, few uh, years. So this is probably not only um, a pediatric uh, problem as the adults are starting to see something, but uh, there are a different uh, presentation of this disease and different uh, problems that could be uh, not only pulmonary hypertension but uh, lung problems, especially in newborns. There may be also uh, bone problems, uh, patella problems, and uh, this is clearly something that need to be looked at when you have a patient. Uh, with pediatric pulmonary hypertension. Another one that is quite interesting that was recently published is SUX17. And this uh, is not only interesting for pediatric pH um, as um, uh, uh, the idiopathic form, for example, but it seems that there may be uh, some relation with uh, congenital heart disease pulmonary hypertension. So there is clearly a lot of work that uh, needs to be done, but uh, uh, papers are coming out uh, regularly on uh, uh, genetics uh, of uh, pH and pH, and uh, this is a very interesting uh, field uh, to, um, to follow. This slide is uh, from the paper of the World Congress, and uh, we will discuss later uh, in the second part the uh, risk factors and the follow-up of the patients. But this table was indeed built to look at what are the determinants of risk 
which uh, lead then to uh, uh, assess the patient if he's in high risk or lower risk and uh, uh, adapt the treatment to, um, uh, if possible, translate the patient in the low risk uh, uh, part. So there is clinical evidence of RV failure, progression of symptoms, some exercise testing and the six minute walk test is still present uh, and can be done in patients over six to seven year of age. Gross, functional class, serum, uh, uh, BNP or NT pro BNP, some echocardiovascular, echocardiography uh, measurements. And uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, as you see, there is a long list and some hemodynamics measurements. So this is really uh, something that can help indeed the physician to, to follow the patient. You probably all know this table that has been adapted uh, uh, by several other authors, uh, but that's the last one that was published by uh, Ansman in uh, GHLT. Um, and you see that this is indeed um, uh, the diagnostic approach that uh, should be done in uh, each single patient that uh, you uh, want to diagnose with uh, pulmonary hypertension. Why it is indeed necessary to follow all these uh, different aspects of uh, the algorithm is that at the end, uh, to decide and to confirm that the patient has idiopathic or irritable uh, pH, you clearly need to do all the workup. If you don't do the workup, you may miss indeed a few diagnoses, and this is really uh, important. Uh, recently, uh, we have faced indeed a, a few patients that were referred for idiopathic uh, pH, and finally, after a full workup, were found to have uh, some rare forms of pH like uh, portopulmonary or um, uh, connective tissue disease, uh, pulmonary hypertension. So this is really important uh, to uh, uh, follow uh, the full uh, diagnostic uh, uh, algorithm. These are the, um, indeed the statements that uh, were um, published by um, the Pulmonary Vascular Disease Network uh, guidelines and um, that are indeed the challenges and the future direction that uh, clinical research should follow in pediatric pH. Uh, as you will see from the publication that we will discuss today, this is indeed really done. It is just not so easy uh, uh, to be done. And there, were, there was a, 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 a meeting organized by the AMA and the FDA with the experts that discussed some of these aspects and we will discuss this paper a, a little bit uh, later during this uh, presentation. A paper that was published in Cardiology in the Young was the result of the discussion among the working group of the AEPC on uh, pulmonary hypertension. And the idea was to come with um, a recommendation uh, for training in pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we all know and we all agree that um, you need a special expertise for uh, uh, follow-up of these patients. And um, this paper uh, is interesting uh, and for, for the main reason is that um, it is indeed shared between uh, the basics that you should know about pulmonary hypertension and what would be a, an advanced training in this uh, uh, special uh, uh, disease. What you, you can see is that sometimes in some pediatric centers, you may not have access to a lot of uh, uh, patients, but you, you can be linked also with an adult center uh, to gain experience, especially if you go uh, uh, for a, a specific training in, in, in an a single center. So very interesting paper that I suggest you to read to, to see what are the requirements that um, are for pulmonary hypertension. This is clearly not, I would say, illegal, but this is what is suggested by the uh, AEPC. A few, sites, a few slides ago, I was um, uh, mentioning the, this particular paper. So in June 2017, and it took a, a while to publish this, uh, this paper, um, 
a meeting uh, joined the uh, academia, patient association, industry, and regulators, and in particular the FDA and the EMA, that are the regulatory authorities that uh, at the end approve or not the different drugs that we use in uh, uh, pediatric patients with pulmonary hypertension. So th this first table that I show you here shows uh, how many drugs are indeed approved for pulmonary hypertension and how many are indeed approved for children. And as you can see, uh, very few are approved uh, in children. And uh, if they are approved, sometimes this is uh, uh, not exactly the same between uh, uh, Europe or United States. May, MEA and FDA may not agree on the approval. This is indeed true for uh, sildenafil and um, uh, also how the, um, the drug were, uh, the drug Bosentan was approved in Europe and uh, US. So in Europe it's uh, approved for use based on pharmacokinetics and uh, the FDA approved the drug and labeled it uh, based on hemodynamic data. On this uh, particular slide, you see uh, what are indeed the, the efficacy endpoints that could be used in pediatric trials. Because one of the main reasons of this meeting is what is the trial design and the trial endpoint that would be acceptable and feasible for a, a pediatric study that would lead to the approval of a, a drug in this particular field. So as you can see, basically it's quite difficult to, to find a, a, an endpoint in pediatrics that um, uh, can be uh, I can lead to a feasible study. In adults, there is no question that uh, exercise testing and then time to clinical worsening has been used. In pediatrics, uh, time to clinical worsening uh, is difficult for the reason that it seems that we need a lot of patients, even if studies are currently designed with this particular endpoint. Using only an exercise capacity such as six minute work test is not easy as you cannot do it in all uh, patients. Then going to endpoints that are a little bit different, um, like only functional class, only BNP, this seems difficult. As you can see, echocardiography, the main limitation is reproducibility and indeed the change that you can really assess. We'll come back to that. I think echocardiography is interesting, but basically there is publication every month with a new marker. And that means that um, we don't have a strong one that we can use to really decide for treatment, but uh, use it uh, as a primary endpoint in a, in a pediatric uh, study. This is also true for MRI, which is very interesting, but may require indeed uh, uh, sedation or um, pricing or uh, some other problems. Hemodynamic is still uh, uh, something that uh, authorities are against because of um, the problem of uh, risk during cardiac catheterization, something that can be discussed because the risk may be different uh, from centers to centers. But uh, for a multi-center trial, this is maybe a, a concern that uh, regulatory authorities uh, are uh, not willing to use the, this particular endpoint. Uh, just coming back, and I insist a little bit, if you have time to read this paper, that uh, shows something that I uh, discussed before about genetics. So TBX4 uh, uh, is really something that um, is currently found in some neonatal and pediatric pulmonary hypertension. And uh, this paper is interesting, showing uh, what kind of different presentation you can see. And it, it's not only this uh, patella syndrome with pH, but you can have a different presentation. And especially that's something that is interesting for newborns that present some forms of so-called uh, uh, PPHN, but that indeed have uh, some uh, uh, lesion that are linked to a, a TBX4 mutation. So that's something you can look for when you have a, a newborn that is difficult to treat.
These are uh, a few other publications on genetics that appeared last year, and not all were uh, on pediatric pulmonary hypertension, but you see that uh, on the uh, genome-wide association study and meta-analysis that was published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine by Rhodes and colleagues, uh, that um, uh, one uh, mutation in uh, SUC 16, 17 sorry, um, is uh, uh, potentially a, a factor, uh, a risk factor for pulmonary hypertension. And that's something really that is uh, coming in the field of uh, uh, pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, I like very much the editorial that uh, was written by Rob and Marin in uh, GHLT on the intersection between genotype and phenotype. And uh, we know that uh, patients may present with mutation uh, that are quite similar, but uh, phenotype that are different. So, so this is also something that um, we should work uh, on to, to better describe the, the phenotype of some of our patients. With this slide, we move to um, diagnosis. And uh, you see on this panel different things that you can measure and do and that are related with the uh, diagnostic algorithm. So ECG is interesting. We'll come back with ECG um, uh, with a Japanese publication uh, that is quite interesting. Chest X-ray, so quite simple examination, echocardiography, we will come back to different measurements. You see here some uh, evaluation of the um, uh, ejection pattern uh, in the pulmonary artery, the Doppler ejection pattern. Uh, you see uh, the drawing of um, uh, excentricity index that can be measured. Clearly, MRI can bring some very interesting aspects, um, and there is ongoing studies with MRI, and then more uh, sophisticated studies like uh, dual CT energy and some others. So there is a lot of different things that can be done. Not to forget is the full laboratory evaluation that should assess uh, simple things, and you can have BNP and T pro BNP, which is not a diagnostics test, but gives you an idea of. Uh, um, how the disease impact the heart, uh, the cardiac studies that we discussed before, respiratory studies, clearly you need to exclude any lung disease and uh, uh, coagulation studies to exclude any potential risk for uh, uh, hypercoagulability, even if uh, uh, chronic thromboembolic uh, pulmonary hypertension in the pediatric age is quite uncommon. Portal hypertension is something that is gaining interest. Um, more patients are diagnosed over the last two, three years uh, with portal pulmonary hypertension. And clearly this should be uh, excluded before diagnosing uh, uh, idiopathic pH. The thyroid panel, the chronic, uh, uh, the, the connective tissue disease panel, and as well as HIV, HIV testing and uh, clearly an, an, an history of uh, use of uh, different toxin or drugs that may have an impact on the pulmonary vascular bed. I was telling you about uh, electrocardiogram and um, this is a very interesting paper from uh, uh, the Japanese uh, PH uh, working group where they indeed have something extremely special in Japan, which is uh, uh, school echocardiography screening. And um, so any school attendant uh, will have an ECG. So based on that, they have indeed the possibility to see ACG changes and maybe ACG changes that suggest pulmonary hypertension like RV hypertrophy. So the problem uh, with this, and we, we did with uh, Ralph Berger from Groningen, uh, an editorial on this paper published in the Blue Journal, is that finally this is not indeed an early diagnosis. Uh, once you have the changes on ECG, as you can see uh, in this manuscript, the, the, the mean PAP and the PVR is already quite high. Uh, 
and um, as such this is not early uh, diagnosis but that may be a uh, diagnosis in asymptomatic patients that already have indeed a significant increase in uh, in pulmonary uh, hypertension so we're still far from uh, uh, screening in uh, uh, early uh, disease but that's a very very interesting uh, uh, paper on uh, how we can detect patients with pulmonary hypertension before symptoms there were a lot of echocardiography publication uh, uh, and I as I said, uh, put in my title multi -public, multiple publications with multiple different echo parameters so each publication is dealing with one specific parameter and at the end it's extremely difficult uh, to uh, outline one single parameter or a few of these parameters that will be really really um, helpful in not only diagnosis and screening so you may have to do a full echo uh, uh, to obtain all these parameters and then uh, decide based on them which one is better TAPSI is interesting and uh, clearly ventricular interactions with the use of eccentricity index is something that um, seems to be uh, uh, quite good to predict what happened and to assess the changes when you use treatments and that's the parameters that are currently trialed in some of the studies in pediatrics and we'll see what we can do uh, with them so the systematic review of uh, uh, Rung and, and colleagues uh, shows that uh, we still need large sample studies which are very difficult to do in pediatrics to uh, improve the accuracy of uh, transthoracic echo and the table uh, on this uh, uh, slide that is coming from the guidelines of GHLT uh, mention uh, you see many and many and many uh, parameters and there is still other ones so I think there is too many parameters uh, should we have one that is perfect probably we will just mention this one and everybody will use this one so we're still far from that but we're making progress with non-invasive assessment of pH and that's uh, something clearly we need in the next future so another way of um, assessing uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, with uh, non-invasive measurements is MRI and clearly MRI is um, improving uh, months after months and uh, that's uh, really extremely interesting to see what we can do with MRI I just mentioned this paper from uh, the Netherlands on the right ventricular and vascular coupling which is um, uh, something extremely interesting because that assess really the capability of uh, uh, and the capacity of the right ventricle to cope with uh, pulmonary hypertension which is probably at the end uh, the one of the most important parameters is to have a, a good functioning uh, right ventricle so MRI can do that it's not easy there's a lot of other things that are currently done with MRI and I'm sure that in the next couple of years we will have a further improvement in MRI still remains that uh, we need to improve the, uh, uh, the, the, the how we uh, obtain the data because sometimes that can be quite long the other problem is that MRI is not accessible to all centers easily uh, and that may be indeed a, a, a problem we cannot avoid to discuss cardiac characterization but this still remains uh, the gold standard for diagnosis and uh, we'll agree on that I will not come back uh, on the publications on risk of cardiac characterization there were indeed none uh, over this year but um, a few uh, in the two three years before uh, I will discuss mainly acute vasoreactivity testing which is one of the important part of the diagnostic uh, CAT that allows you to discriminate the patients that have vasoreactivity Activity. and uh, you know that uh, potential patients called idiopathic pH with vasoreactivity are, no cl are now classified in another group uh, because they indeed respond very well to calcium channel blockers and they should be treated with these drugs uh, and have a quite good uh, 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 outlook so this paper uh, from uh, uh, a large group of PPH net uh, 
uh, from the PVRI pediatric and CHD task force concluded that um, it was difficult to standardize the AVT and uh, also that uh, we don't know exactly which of the definition of vasoreactivity we should use. Uh, in uh, the top registry, uh, it has been published that um, clearly uh, something can be done uh, with regards to vasoreactivity and it seems that the patients that respond better to calcium channel blocker are the ones that are um, indeed diagnosed as vasoreactive patients based on the SIDBON criteria. When you use the SIDBON criteria, which, you are, which are mentioned as SB on the, this uh, slide, and are treated with calcium channel blocker, they have an extremely good outcome, uh, like in the, the adult patients. So basically, the real responders using SIDBON criteria are probably a percentage of patients that are similar to the adult ones. And that's the patients that will do well long-term on CCBs. So that's why it's extremely important to perform cardiac catheterization with a good AVT. AVT uh, uh, in this paper uh, uh, suggest to be, is suggested to be done with um, inhaled nitric oxide, if not possible with inhaled iloprost. When you use other uh, drugs, probably you um, can make some mistakes about the uh, vasoreactivity. So preferably with nitric oxide or iloprost. Nowadays, it's impossible not to discuss uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and see uh, if this can be used also in uh, pulmonary hypertension. So um, nice paper from Keeley showing that uh, you may use different uh, uh, aspects of AI for uh, uh, idiopathic uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, patients that are at risk of having poor outcome. And on the right, uh, a nice paper from Japan, again, showing that uh, you can probably predict uh, pulmonary to systemic flow ratio in patients with congenital heart disease based on uh, uh, an AI uh, um, evaluation of a chest radiograph, which um, in, in some ways we reflect uh, QPQS, and if you have QPQS, you may decide of um, potential surgery or not based on that. So, probably not ready for prime time, but something that can uh, uh, be um, used um, in the future. This ends the first part, and I uh, thank you very much for your attention.